Hello, I'm Mike Pothier, I'm the Program Manager for the Catholic Parliamentary Liaison Office, and I'm talking to the Director of our office, Father Peter John Pearson, about the situation of refugees, asylum seekers and migrants during this time of the COVID-19 lockdown. Peter John, are the refugees and the migrants in South Africa at the moment being fairly treated in terms of the disaster regulations, or do you find that they are suffering unfair discrimination in some ways? Yeah, that's an important question because there are two answers. The initial regulations that um, came out at the time of the lockdown was announced uh, discriminated a great deal against uh, refugees um, in terms of access to um, support funding and uh, especially for those who own small businesses, um, spas, shops and so forth. That was very uh, quickly remedied. Um, there was a lot of public pressure, there was a lot of advocacy, uh, this office included, um, and it was um, changed quite rapidly. The concern now, and, and so the obvious discrimination um, doesn't exist at, at one level. The concern now is around the, um, the grants for um, relief that the minister announced of 350 Rand that um, is meant for those who are not receiving any kind of um, support from other uh, government bodies, SASA or um, any of the schemes. And um, there, the, they keep talking and I need to just say in brackets, um, the regulations have not been gazetted yet, so we don't know for sure. Um, but they keep talking about citizens. They keep talking about documented people, which would exclude a significant number of people who are in, um, in, in very vulnerable situations. Thinking, for instance, of undocumented children who would at schools have access to school feeding uh, programs and who wouldn't necessarily qualify um, if they have no documents for some of the other grants that are available. This would be South African and um, foreign uh, children, but foreign children would be um, particularly vulnerable uh, if they are undocumented. The other um, deep concern would be, and it's an area of concern to us, that those who are awaiting, asylum seekers who are awaiting final adjudication of their claims um, would be documented had there not been such a bureaucratic backlog, had there not been such um, poor services at the Department of Home Affairs. And now because of those poor services um, and that backlog, uh, they are um, prevented from accessing um, support at this time, which is there for documented people or people with a certain level of documentation, even if they um, are refugees or migrants. So the unfair, um, the unfairness um, is linked to 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 those groups and um, and and migrants, um, asylum seekers are the two most vulnerable groups. Um, refugees have documentation and are able to access. Um, so fairly treated? No. But um, there is, for refugees, um, more access now and guaranteed access than there was at the beginning of the lockdown. And what about the um, provisions for government support of small businesses, spaza shops, and so on? At one stage, it appeared that that would only be forthcoming for South African citizens who ran such businesses. Has that situation changed? That situation has changed. You might recall that the initial um, uh, stipulation was for South Africans and for those who employed 70% um, South African staff. Um, that has changed. Um, the only condition is the same condition as applies to South Africans, to citizens, um, and that is that they have to comply with all the other, with the health regulations, um, they have to be yeah. registered, they have to have documentation. So that has changed. And that changed very quickly. 
Right. But nevertheless, when we look at this new um, social uh, relief of distress grant, the 350 euros, that be made available for people who don't get the other social grants, what you're saying is that there's going to be a large number of migrants uh, and children included who are simply not going to have the documentation to qualify for that grant. Indeed, I'm saying that. And therefore, um, a number of groups working in this area are asking for clarification. We asked for clarification in a letter many signed um, asking the minister to respond by yesterday evening um, so that there is certainty that these vulnerable groups will have access uh, to that grant. And um, likewise for clarity around the schools, uh, the children who would otherwise have had access to, to the feeding program. I'm not aware that there's been a response um, to date. And you mentioned also the bureaucratic backlog at the Department of Home Affairs, um, which one assumes has got worse now with the lockdown because many, if most perhaps, of their offices have been closed. But I think I heard the minister talking about some of their offices reopening. What is the situation then for um, asylum seekers and, and other migrants who need to get documentation or have permits updated or whatever and simply can't access a, a home affairs office? Um, you're quite right. A number of home affairs offices opened um, on the 4th of May under the level four um, regulations, um, primarily to register um, births, which, as you know, have to be registered within 30 days of the birth. Um, the minister has, or the department has said that any um, overdue, registra um, overdue uh, registrations will be regarded as being within that period. So, so that's one area that they have. Um, the a regulation also went out at the beginning or a directive went out at the beginning of the lockdown period saying that all um, the um, all determinations or uh, dates for expiry date were um, were regarded as being um, null and void for the period so if they um, maybe not null and void entirely but for that period so if they fall in that period it would there would be um, a, a grace period attached no. to it. So they cannot be detained, sent to Landela, or yeah. um, in any way penalized. Yeah, okay. Same situation that seems to prevail for us in terms of motor car licensing and driver's license. Indeed, indeed. Okay. That's the analogy that's often drawn. No. Yeah. And then turning from kind of government to state um, acts or omissions as far as, as refugees and migrants are concerned to the community. We obviously are always a bit worried about outbreaks, xenophobia, Afrophobia, uh, particularly in times of crisis like this. What have you picked up on? on that? There is a real concern. There's a real concern. Um, I've participated in um, Zoom meetings that have raised this question. Um, a recent um, survey indicated that 7% um, of the South African population have quite um, high levels of, um, of, of xenophobic um, attitudes. And 7% of uh, a population is quite a high number. That's the, the number of people who hold quite extreme views. There would be a whole group of people who hold less extreme views, but nonetheless, could be provoked into xenophobic responses quite easily. So that remains a problem and there are a number of groups working and monitoring um, that uh, situation. There have been outbreaks and it's been on the public television, there have been outbreaks of xenophobic, um, uh, um, outbreaks of xenophobia in, um, in a number of places, especially around the provision of, of resources, um, food parcels, uh, people asking, um, people who are distributing, asking for citizens to stand in one queue and making sure that those were satisfied and then leaving um, non-citizens to take what was over, um, those kinds of um, 
of, of problems exist and they have a real potential for, um, for being inflamed and, um, and many people are seriously worried about that and I think it's something we need to, um, to warn people not to um, fall prey to or to be seduced no. into the kind of rhetoric um, and especially um, also you know thinking ahead um, the politicization of resources of um, of of those kinds of binaries of attitude of citizen non citizen um, going ahead looking towards the election local elections next year they all lay the foundations for um, more and unnecessary um, disturbances and for you know, damaging the social cohesion that does exist and that is in many places very fragile. So it is something we definitely need to be concerned about. As far as I know, though, there has not been any of the kind of provocative statements that we have seen in the past from some political leaders in this country who have probably unwisely tried to blame various things on foreigners, crime, and all the rest of it. I haven't really picked up any of that during this particular crisis. No, I think that's right. I think um, there has been much more of a responsibility um, around that kind of inflammatory language that, as you say, has been used um, across various parties um, and um, quite recklessly. Um, there hasn't been that. Um, and there is a group that monitors and sends out reports um, uh, sp specifically focused on political speak and on um, party um, talk. Uh, and there hasn't been a very much um, at all um, in that domain. So that's been one of the areas in which there's been um, some sensibility um, or sensibilities prevailed. And then just looking further afield, um, the rest of Africa, we know that there are huge um, refugee and migrant populations in some African countries, Kenya, Uganda, for example, and others. What are you picking up about uh, the conditions under which um, they are living in those countries, uh, or some of which also have lockdowns and other kind of emergency responses to, the, to COVID-19? There's a general well, there are three things that are emerging in the in the narratives around um, people in especially in camps during lockdown the The first is that it's almost impossible to um, practice any of the kinds of um, conventional um, precautions so social distancing is impossible um, the access to water is more difficult and in some cases almost impossible and what is available often a, a, a measured amount per family is needed for cooking and for other things. So, so already you are dealing with um, in Africa, but also uh, on the Greek islands with um, situations that are real tinder boxes for a further explosion. And um, and that is something that is a great cause of concern. Um, it is also uh, so that's the one area, just it's um, a disaster that really could be waiting to happen. And it's um, it's the nature of those um, kinds of camps um, that, that cause that. The, yeah. the second area of concern is that um, the potential for human rights abuses are, are much greater. A number of other areas are being monitored and people who work in the monitoring services and in um, support services in those camps are not um, available to enter and exit them. And so the, um, some of the, the, um, the kinds of normal safety valves in that community is not there. Um, people who are going out to work um, can't do that and therefore the tensions um, are exacerbated and gender-based violence, um, corruption, all sorts of abuses um, are, are a bit more rife than they were uh, previously. And so that whole human rights uh, situation is a cause of concern. But thirdly, there's a greater cause of concern 
because in almost all the um, regulations and in the discussions around regulations in all the countries that host quite big um, uh, refugee migrant communities, there's almost been no consultation with or particular consideration of the plights that those vulnerable groups are in. And that has meant there have been gaps in the kinds of responses, the kinds of policy responses um, in, in, the, in the broader uh, COVID-19 um, series of responses. Okay, and then I think lastly, the position of the church, I mean, here and uh, um, refugees and migrants have been one of the key concerns of uh, Pope Francis's papacy over the last number of years. Um, again, what, what are you hearing from the Vatican, from uh, other bishops' conferences in Africa and here locally about uh, uh, church responses to the question? I am... Um... It hasn't been a focus in most of the responses from Episcopal conferences in Africa. Um, that might still come as the situation uh, worsens on the continent. Um, there have been responses from um, a number of the European uh, bishops' conferences and just yesterday from the um, Episcopal Conference of the United States. Um, and uh, a big part of theirs was a warning against xenophobic um, attitudes emerging, against the latent racism, um, and against um, the way in which there seems to be a, a kind of um, a demonizing of uh, Chinese uh, Americans and Chinese people mm. in, in the States. So that was recognized. The Holy See has been quite active at two levels of increasing um, material uh, responses to places that are worse hit um, and um, opening up um, new possibilities pastorally uh, for those who are most marginalized and includes uh, traveling people, um, refugees, migrants, um, a number of people who are who fall through the cracks of a lot of domestic um, uh, regulations, but also a real concerted effort to begin to think around what a post-pandemic uh, kind of world is going to look like, and sp specifically what a post-pandemic world will look like for people who are um, on the move for people who are on the margins. And a particular focus has been for people who are um, um, struggling to make ends meet and therefore crossing borders in order to um, just get the bare minimum. So, so that discussion um, is quite an intense um, discussion that's happening in the church at the moment. And that's something that we can expect probably very much in this country because the economic fallout for uh, Southern Africa is going to be immense. We already have a country like Zimbabwe, which uh, is economically even far worse off than we are. Um, we can probably expect heightened movement of people, the so-called economic refugees, um, for probably years to come. I agree. And I think that has been part of the um, the Pope's particular emphasis in this pandemic, saying that, you know, the vulnerability of migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, and internally displaced persons is going to intensify. How do we, and there are two areas that he has just very recently focused on, how do we provide adequate protection? And how do we, um, how do we, think ahead around um, integration. But the protection, a human rights approach to um, the, these vulnerable communities has been the key emphasis of the Vatican's um, discussions um, recently. Good. I think we'll leave it there. Peter John, thank you very much. Very nice talking to you. Thank you.